thousands of medical, industrial, military, agricultural chemicals which have all appeared onto the market through the same channel, safety tests on animals. Worldwide, man, woman, child, bird, fish, cat, dog, rivers, lakes, trees, areas of the planet are being killed, damaged by this deluge. The Imperial Cancer Research Fund issued a statement. One of the biggest myths in recent years is that there is a cancer epidemic caused by exposure to radiation, pollution, pesticides and food additives. Only last week, yet another research body pointed the finger at a group of chemicals as being cancer causative. Immediately, Cancer Research UK leapt in to defend. Why? The fact that no genuine cancer research organisation would go out of its way to protect these industries is completely lost on the celebrity supporters, the uh, cycle for life and race for life disciples and the other well-meaning people shaking tubs in the street. The fact is that cancer is one of the world's largest money spinners. It is inextricably linked with the world's number one petrochemicals. They have a very close symbiotic, mutually supportive relationship. In cancer research, a previously healthy but frightened rodent, rabbit, dog, cat, whatever, is subject to various procedures which produce artificial tumours. These tumours have nothing whatsoever to spontaneously occur in human cancer. They then proceed to suppress or remove these tumours with petrochemical synthetics and they will tell you with a perfectly straight face that this nonsense is cancer research. According to Dr. Erwin D. Bross, PhD, former Director of Biostatistics at Russell Park Memorial, from a scientific standpoint, animal model systems in cancer research have been a total failure. They not only kill animals, they also kill humans. There is no good factual evidence to show that the use of animals in cancer research has led to the prevention or cure of a single human cancer. In the ancient wisdom, Morley Stainer wrote, Still the money pours in for cancer research from kind-hearted, well-meaning people. In spite of the fact that the much-advertised cures and discoveries invariably turn out year after year to be no cure at all, but rather an aggravation of the trouble. The proof of this being the steady increase of the disease on all sides. Surely there should be some result to show as a partial excuse for the torturing of so many animals. The public still does not realise that nothing is likely to happen, no progress even possible, whilst the research is done on demonstrably wrong lines. The critical point about this quote is that it is from the year 1940. Essentially, the situation is the same as it was 66 years ago, except of course for the massive increase in cancer statistics. Although the causes of most diseases are well known, Practically no money is allocated to their prevention, the most obvious and beneficial route to take, except to the drugs, chemical and medical establishments, that is. There is no money to be made from a healthy population. The only direction we can go in if we are to reverse this ever-encroaching tide of disease is through disease prevention, and when health has broken down, by engaging in genuine clinical research methods, truly applicable to human beings, and their health problems. This is, of course, the opposite direction to that which we are going now, which relies on the ludicrous attempt at creating artificial sickness in once healthy animals. So why does vivisection continue despite its proven worthlessness? The simple answer is money. An enormous industry has been built up around animal experimentation, the very survival of which depends on people not knowing the truth. This includes the countless laboratory animal suppliers, hundreds of other companies providing cages, food, bedding, experimental apparatus, water containers, electrodes, scalpels, restraining devices, and animal transportation. Thousands of vivisectors whose interests lie in career advancement through the publication of their papers in the many medical and research journals, 
as well as the large research grants available, which by and large come from the drugs industry. The many chemical and pharmaceutical corporations whose multi-billion pound profits are dependent on the unreliability of animal testing. The countless research institutions and universities that benefit financially from the continued use of animals. Many are founded either by drug companies directly or through medical research charities. Some of the UK's most well-known medical charities routinely fund research involving animals. And finally, the biggest benefactor of all, the medical industry itself, whose profits are dependent on a state of no cure. As we have seen, secrecy and deception are essential to the continuation of vivisection. The media has, by and large, been a more than enthusiastic participant in this, with the vivisection industry having been allowed virtually unlimited TV and radio airtime, and unlimited newspaper space to put forward their case, the opposition having been limited to ineffective moral arguments that in no way challenge the countless false claims of the pro-vivisection lobby. The reason for this is understandable. If you watch TV or read newspapers, you'll be only too aware of the countless advertisements run by those whose existence relies upon vivisection. Besides pharmaceutical drugs, animals are used in the testing of cosmetics and hair dyes, petrol, brake fluid, and other automotive products detergents, oven cleaners, herbicides and pesticides, disinfectants, toothpaste and other body care products, paints, dyes and solvents, food additives, artificial sweeteners and colorings, and thousands of other chemical substances that might be toxic for mankind. The media relies heavily upon advertising from the chemical, pharmaceutical and the cosmetic industries, which in turn relies on the false assurances of safety that animal testing brings. However, there might well be further reasons for the media's refusal to reveal the truth about animal experimentation. Some time ago, concerned about the seemingly relentless promotion of vivisection by the BBC, the British Anti-Vivisection Association discovered that there appeared to be a significant number of people with a pro-vivisectionist bias working in one capacity or other for the organization amongst them being several people with close ties to the pro-vivisectionist Research Defence Society. It was also discovered that Sir Christopher Bland, then chairman of the BBC's Board of Governors, was chairman of the multinational Life Sciences International, manufacturers of equipment for research laboratories, including those engaged in animal research. Sir Christopher and two other LSI bosses shared six million pounds following the sale of LSI to US corporation Thermo Instruments Systems. In 2004 it was revealed in a letter from Home Office Minister Caroline Flint to parliamentary questions by Mike Hancock MP that the government has not commissioned or evaluated any formal research on the efficacy of animal experiments and has no plans to do so. If no research has ever been conducted into exactly whether vivisection works or not, one must question the reason for the government's enthusiastic support of it, including in 2006 Prime Minister Tony Blair's widely reported signing of an online petition in support of vivisection, a whole host of new laws designed at curtailing once legal peaceful protest, spending £150,000 of taxpayers' money on legal fees for Oxford University in its plans to build a new vivisection laboratory, and allocating a reported £100 million underwriting the costs associated with new animal research facilities in the UK. One reason for all this might be the appointment in 1997, six months after New Labour's election victory, of billionaire David Sainsbury, whose donations to the Labour Party since 1994 total over £11 million, to the House of Lords as Lord Sainsbury. In 1998, he was made Science 